So this is community archiving on the decentralized web. Web3 technologies are enabling the preservation of information in unique and transformative ways, particularly for marginalized communities. Today we're going to be hearing from leaders, um, thought leaders, and the most forward-thinking archivists and civic leaders to explore how these innovations can protect and preser preserve critical information for future generations across the web. We'll also explore the concerns and challenges for legacy institutions, such as libraries and research institutions, of adopting these technologies, as well as how organizations like Digital Public Library and the Internet Archive and others are helping to bridge this gap. So I'm going to start by introducing the panelists, of course. Um, joining me remotely from Prague is Yvonne Ng. She is a digital archivist at Witness. Witness is an international nonprofit helping people use video and technology to protect and defend human rights. Yvonne trains and supports partners on collecting, managing, and preserving video documentation for human rights advocacy. Outside of Witness, Yvonne serves on the board of directors for the Association of Moving Image Archivists and on the advisory board of the Memory Lab Network and Documenting the Now. And then on stage with us, we have Brewster Kale here in the middle. He is the founder and digital librarian at the Internet Archive, a nonprofit that is building the digital library of internet sites and other cultural artifacts in digital form. He talks often about providing universal access to all knowledge, and he makes it happen through his work with the Internet Archive. We have Kelsey Braceman. She's a civics science fellow at the, with the Environmental Data and Governance Initiative. Also, do you say that edgy? Okay, great. <laughs> it's so cute, so I wanted to make sure edgy. Um, this is a watchdog group for federal environmental data. In her current role with edgy, Kelsey is building on her work. Um, oh, yep, in edgy is pronounced edgy archiving, data and environmental enforcement watch. She focuses on data ownership models, environmental accountability, and intentional community. That's amazing. Um, and she's working with the Starling Lab as director of the Archive Accelerator, exploring the applicability of Web3 solutions for environmental justice groups. And then last but not least, hey there, we have John Bracken. He is the executive director of Digital, Digital Public Library of America, a nonprofit focused on maximizing public access to our shared history, culture, and knowledge. And myself, hi, uh, I'm, Bailey, <laughs> I'm Bailey Reitzel. Um, I have a longtime crypto journalist, started writing about crypto when it was just Bitcoin back in 2012. Um, so it feels like it's been 30 years, honestly. <laughs> it has really taken a toll on my psyche. Um, but I still love what the work that crypto is doing and the questions that it's asking. So I want to start with um, sort of setting up what is wrong with the internet today and how we archive the internet. And Brewster, I'm going to pass this to you. So while I'm starting this, just be thinking about your answer here. Um, I, I think one of the things that's really powerful about decentralized storage is the fact that it can lead to permanence of these digital objects where we spend most of our lives. Um, or maybe not where we spend most of our lives, but where we are spending a considerable amount of our lives today. Um, and it's hard to really understand what that means unless something tragic happens to some of the data that you love. So in a personal experience, um, I've written about crypto across a wide range of mainstream media publications and also crypto publications. One of those crypto publications, I had done sort of archiving work on Bitcoin's 10-year anniversary, um, which was a couple years ago, I believe. Uh, so 100 pieces of content over print, audio, and video, and that was all on a custom-built website. When that website, um, when the broader publication ended up doing a rebrand, I lost it. Uh, it is seemingly probably somewhere still, um, but that website has gone down. Um, you know, you get the 404 era, like we, like many of us have probably stumbled on, on the internet, and that really, you know, that hurt, and that really solidified why the decentralized web and decentralized storage um, is so important to me, because that's, that's part of my resume, right? And so I've lost that part of my resume. Um, so that is to say, passing it to you, Brewster, to sort of like set up the, the problem with the web as it is today, and then how this decentralized storage, decentralized web architecture fixes that. Yeah, well, the web is great. Right? We were all probably <laughs> here because um, we could all join into the web without getting permission. That it was just by paying attention to the protocols, we could set up a website on our, you know, if you're old enough, on your old Mac, 
um, or, uh, and, and the like. So it was terrific and it felt decentralized in a way that AOL or these other systems or even the big publishers, you know, getting into the New York Times was really a headache. So you can go and make your own blog, you can own system uh, and make that work with open protocols. All good. Um, <clears throat> But there's a problem. It's completely centralized again, at least for each one of those sources. So it's just like those, those magazines, that's the only place, kinda, that it lives. And the Internet Archive um, tried to fix this by inventing a kludge called the Wayback Machine, by taking a snapshot of all uh, web pages, you know, as often as we can, um, to go and make a record of it so that at least the out of print web pages. Uh, would be available because the average life of a web page is about 100 days before it's either changed or deleted. It's like, Jesus. So that's no way to build a culture. So what do you do then? You know, but the idea of a snapshot of web pages isn't good enough. What we really want is to be able to fork those websites, to have living websites preserved. Right? How do you, but how do you do that? Um, and some of the genesis from, for the uh, decentralized web from our perspective and why we put out this call was to try to build a web that worked a little bit more like, actually, like the old style publishing. It used to be the publishers would go and publish things and they would go and sell them, really sell them, not license them, this is a problem, um, to go and have them be owned by individuals and institutions and there's lots of copies. And then those organizations know what they're supposed to do to go and try to preserve this stuff. That's not how the web works. Um, so can we um, get back to some of that structure where you're still having people get paid, good, um, but there's many copies existing in many places that will outlive any one of those uh, institutions um, uh, folding, becoming unavailable, or the like. So can we go and make the web work a little bit more like Git, if you will? Right? You say, okay, that's, a, that's still centralized. But you know, the idea that you can check out and go and keep running websites with their data as it existed at a particular time. Kind of surreal, right? Um, so we tried um, at least going and making the Internet Archive but decentralized, the dweb.archive.org is a prototype. And now we're trying to go and put a lot of the, we're almost at 100 petabytes at the Internet Archive, which is kind of awesome, um, of these materials. And we're trying to put as much as we can into Filecoin and storage um, to go and try out and test out and help along these nascent technologies you know, uh, and try to get them to actually work. So we're looking for more participation to go and sort of see this vision through where there's going to be multiple copies, there's selling, not licensing, there's um, multiple locations that we have lots of winners. You can actually have people get paid by publishing on the web, wouldn't that be awesome? Um, and be able to uh, have an enduring legacy of the works, the cultural works of our generation. Yeah. That's the idea. Uh, John, I see you taking notes over here. Um, I, mean, I love this. Talking, I, 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 yeah, I love this. I love this. So, did you want to add anything to that? Just as 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 the Digital Public Library of America, like what you struggle with already in sort of archiving that data, um, um, yeah. and, and then you know, talk a little bit about how you're using this Web three decentralized web. Yeah, no, that's a great, what you struggle with is like, how much time do you got, right? Yeah, right. How, and, and I think, you know, one of the as key aspects of the Digital Public Library of America is everything we do is in partnership and collaboration. So we get to work with over 4,000 place-based institutions across the U.S., ranging in size from the Internet Archive and the National Archives to small, really small community archives. And I guess, I'll, you know, to maybe to tell you a little bit about what that struggle looks like, I'll tell you a story about one of the archives, community-based archive that I visited uh, pre-pandemic in a major city. They maybe have one and a half full-time employees. Um, there's, they have amazing collections in boxes, right, upstairs in their attic, many of which have been damaged by storms and rain. Um, there was a car accident, a car ran into their corner and took out part of the building, right? And so this is a vital, it's a community-based institution where people from the community literally built the building and have maintained the building. They don't have a digital strategy, they don't have a digital approach, right? And so as we, as our team, have been engaging in conversations and exploring more intentionally, I mean, it's gone back a couple of years, but even more so over the last year, about what the possibilities are for our partners of what Brewster's talking about. That's the archetype I have in mind of the, 
you know, the, libraries and archives generally, as some of you know, are overburdened, underappreciated, and underfunded and underequipped. And we also al ask a lot about them. And so what I'm excited about, about the possibilities in leaning at everything Wendy just said, is how do we take advantage of what we've learned over the last, whatever, however long we've been at the table, 20, 30 years, what we did wrong in building the structures of web one and web two, and how we can really intentionally build tools and approaches and processes that put those types of community efforts and their impact first. Sure, yeah. And Yvonne, I'm, I'm gonna kick it to you uh, um, in Prague. Just why is this so important for the communities that you work with? Hi, can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Great, thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, so, um, you know, just speaking of archives, generally archives play a really central role in human rights. So ensuring like basic human rights, like right to know, right to justice, you know, right to reparations. Um, and then in the longer term, we think communities archives play a really important role in creating a sense of uh, belonging, um, shared history, um, identity, um, and enabling memorialization of of a community's history and so you know this this sort of work is facilitated by archives like big and small so like government and institutional archives larger scale archives like Brewster's uh, internet archive and also by like smaller uh community archives like the one that um john mentioned um visiting um you know within within the human rights world there's also a lot of archives um, being maintained by organizations that are not, you know, explicitly archives, but that are doing human rights research, um, doing open source investigations, doing human rights advocacy. And there are really important um, archives of documentation uh, containing like human rights evidence of human rights abuses, um, uh, doc documentation of social movements that are held in those um, collections that can be used for evidentiary purposes, but also for long term memory. Um, purposes as well. Um, so I think the the decentralized web. I mean, I, I think the reason it's really great that we're having this conversation today is because there is an opportunity now, as you know, the decentralized web and Web three is sort of at its beginning stages to have these conversations about how uh, what what the human rights impacts of of the decentralized web um, could be and how to incorporate um, human rights principles from the design, from the beginning, from the design stage. Um, because I think one of the, one of maybe the, one of the shortcomings of, you know, the, the web two or, or uh, you know, the, the internet as it exists now is that, you know, it didn't really um, take into consideration these human rights um, impacts from, from the time that it was being designed and from the time that it started expanding into all these newer markets and not really taking into consideration you know the realities of, of the world and existing inequalities and um, you know and, and human rights violations that were taking place and so that's why we have uh, what what you see now with these sort of band-aid solutions of like content moderation and and oversight boards and content labels on on this information there's a really great article um, by Rebecca McKinnon um, who talks about uh, web 2 and and what you know looking back at it, what could have been done better um, to protect human rights and thinking towards um, um, Web3. So I think, um, yeah, this is a really good time to be having this conversation about how um, the decentralized web can be used to make our societies like, more open, more fair, more inclusive, more democratic, instead of um, making them worse. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just piggybacking off that time, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of articles about this particular artist, and I, I would butcher her name if I even tried, but a Ukrainian artist whose some of her work has been lost um, in, the, uh, in, in Russia invading Ukraine, right? And I don't want to get super political here, um, but, you know, I, I feel that we have the opportunity to sort of make sure that even, you know, a, a physical work getting destroyed is terrible, right? But we have the opportunity to make sure that those physical works are also held in a digital space where they do have permanence and we can look at them for years and years to come. 
Um, one of the, in doing research about decentralized web and also uh, IPFS and Filecoin, one of the things that I had stumbled on is just, you know, um, a high level domain name was dot YU um, at the time when Yugoslavia was, was a country, right? Um, when it was all held together. Uh, that domain name has been totally lost and with it all of that content that was at dot YU, right? And, you know, I don't know what content was there. It never, it never, I never needed to research Yugoslavia at that time. I was quite young when that was happening. Um, and so I have no idea what was on there, but it does, it does feel like we've lost something in the fact that we've lost that. Like I would love to go through those archives and sort of see what was there. So that's just sort of like piggybacking on this opportunity that we, we have. <laughs> awesome, yes, great, great, yeah. I need to go look in the Wayback Machine. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Kelsey to talk a little bit about what Edgy is doing with, commu with community archiving on the decentralized web as well. Um, and just like, you know, again, why this is so important to keep this environmental data in a place that is permanent. Yeah, that's a, uh, well, I'll tell you, part of archiving is part of Edgy's founding story. So in uh, November of 2016, um, we elected Trump, um, who was actively de denying climate science at the time, not to get political, but uh, that did happen. And there was this big concern because something similar had happened in Canada where there was access lost to climate information. And so in the US, a bunch of people sent around an email um, a number of whom are still my collaborators. Um, and basically they said, hey, what do we do to make sure that this doesn't happen here, that we, that we save as much as we can just in case? Because we rely on .gov, right? We believe the things that are at .gov web addresses. Um, but one of the things that we've found as edgy over the course of our work is that there is actually very little regulation around what an agency puts on their website and what they save. Um, and so we actually partnered with, and when I say we, I actually wasn't there yet, um, but we partnered with the Internet Archive for a lot of the archiving, a huge amount, which is still being crawled on a regular basis um, to try to do this preservation. Um, but there's this challenge of, okay, well, you've taken the website information, and if you're familiar with the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine, that's really cool. That's great, and in fact, you know, a lot of people know about this. But it's still kind of in one place, you know, with exceptions, obviously. Um, is that really better? Is that really safer? Is that really the right way to hold critical data? Or is there a way that we could make data more resilient by default? Um, and so that kind of launched our journey and my personal journey, sorry, towards the decentralized web to, to look at this question of can we make data by virtue of its use, can we make it safer? Can we make it more protected? Because any data that is not actively being preserved, that doesn't have a plan for preservation and an action for preservation, by default will disappear. Um, and, and I think that like, even especially with the concept of the Internet Archive, right, people kind of believe that once you put something on the Internet, it's there forever. And it's not. It's, it's just not, um, as you well know. Um, what I'm doing now is kind of more exploratory, experimental, um, and it's a little bit more in this environmental justice space. Um, so, you know, as a bit of a transition, we work on environmental data justice. And the concept of environmental justice is that marginalized groups often have um, basically a double burden of trying of living with the effects of an environmental issue, for example, a petroleum plant that's spewing benzene into the air and causing cancer. Um, then they also have the second burden, which is proving the issue um, and trying to, trying to get someone to deal with the problem. Um, and then you also have data justice, where you have this question of who owns the data, who has power over the data, who chose what was surveilled, who is believed, whose data is listened to. Um, when you look at environmental data justice, the concept is basically that you have these problems of power and control with data in this, in this like much broader concern of um, these, these marginalized communities that are getting this double burden. Um, so what I'm working on now is sort of this hope that says, can we get power and control to people who don't normally get listened to, whose data don't normally get believed, whose stories are maybe not taken as data, whose lived experiences are maybe not um, commonly believed, and can we get them into this space as key stakeholders 
now, early, when we're still deciding how the protocols work, um, so that this time, these voices, which are often not in the room when the decisions are being made about how protocols are built, so that those voices are there and they're saying, wait a minute, that's not going to work for me because. Um, so I know that's a bit all over the place, but no, that that's, great. <laughs> yeah, that was great. that's our current work. Can I just plus one on that? And like, I totally want to hear more about how you do that, what are the processes <laughs> and systems you're implementing for that, because that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do, too. Oh, so nice. the fact that you're already doing it is I want notes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I think, you know, a lot, when I look at the history of crypto, like over my 10 years in the space, I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, sorry, it doesn't feel like we're bringing a lot of diversity to the table, to be fair, in building these protocols. Um, and, you know, the, that's fine in, in certain ways, but it's also very bad in, in many other ways. And so, um, yeah, I don't know, John, if you want to sort of piggyback there on just like what you're, yeah. how you are trying to think about building these systems in a diversified yeah. way, yeah. Well, I think, I mean, um, um, I think one of the nice benefits of, you know, the last two years, I think a lot of us as individuals and as institutions have been able to reflect on our place in history, right? And, right. Mm -hmm. and I think as, an entity that grew out of a legacy institution. We were spun out of Harvard nine years ago. You know, in, an, in a field in which systems of oppression and white supremacy have been baked in, often intentionally, sometimes unintentionally, but often intentionally over hundreds of years, right? That's real work to do, to take on, to, to name that, and to build the structures and processes to, to take that on. And it's also not an 18 month plan. Right, and so I think, you know, Brewster said something last night about it was a reminder that it, even what you just said around, you know, ten years feels like thirty years. <laughs> I'm reminded I have a child who was born in October of 2009, right? So the same, so she's as old as the the white paper, right? The blockchain white paper and the Bitcoin white paper, and you know that's not that long of a period of time. And we're talking about institutions and memories, which and structures of oppression that go back decades and centuries. And so I think to some degree, you know, giving ourselves the freedom and space to think about how we really want to deconstruct that work intentionally um, and giving ourselves the time and freedom and not feeling like we need to move so quickly on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's something we're trying to do just purely by having conversations, right? I mean, just in the last this year, we've probably had a dozen conversations with our core partners about what excites them and worries them about exploring decentralized web technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do you want to add, Brewster? Yeah. I'm going to riff on, 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 on the, the great work that Edgy has done and sort of how we're trying to address. Let's take the Ukrainian crisis and sort of kind of what's going on and just give you some of the, the problems and issues for those of you that want to try to help with some of the problems and issues. Here's kind of what we're seeing. Okay, we get a Ukraine, Ukraine gets attacked. Um, so um, the Internet Archive, um, uh, as well as lots and lots and lots of others go and say, oh my God, what can we do here? There's a Slack channel with over a thousand people on it that are coordinating activities to go and try to digitally archive uh, Ukrainian uh, websites. Now, um, not only is U Ukraine, but also the, uh, there's problems with Russia, right? They're shutting down a lot of their internet structures. A lot of the openness that we've built over the last few decades um, is getting shut down. So the openness, all the, a lot of those uh, magazines, newspapers, um, uh, scientific journals, all those sites are, are really in risk. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of people trying to help figure out how they can coordinate. And Edgy was one of the terrific, uh, really major scale disaster relief uh, or organizations in the digital space. So that's trying to get archiving it. Then they're storing it. Well, you just say, oh, well, we're crypto people. We'll just go and make lots of copies and put it out there. Yeah, maybe. Um, but there's some policy issues around this, especially in who gets access to it and who uses it. So uh, we're getting contacted by a lot of Ukrainians uh, going and saying, I really need to not show up right now um, or I could get killed. 
Um, so there are um, issues and policy issues in these that are more than just the I don't libertarian dream of and any um, uh, barrier to access is censorship. Ah, I, I, whenever I hear the word censorship or freedom, I, I try, to add, try to figure out what do people mean by that and how deep is their understanding of the real issues underneath these. So we've got some, um, some positive motivations, structures, people that are, that are building things towards aggregating people to towards action. But how do you go and build technologies so that they're not all just, say, at the Internet Archive and our replicas? Um, and we're trying to work towards that. This community is trying to work towards that. But then how do we also have policy structures that allow flexibility to make it so that the real world doesn't actually, we don't end up building something worse. Um, and unintentional consequences is, should be the, just the byline of almost everything we do. Um, so we should try to figure out how do we go and build these technologies um, to, to work? And what I love is you guys are here, right? I mean, and that we're here, that we're trying, right? We're participating in these new technologies to try to figure out how do you go and keep a North Star? How do you keep some of the ideas and structures and the complexity and the, you know, it's not just solved with a, just a magic wand of a new protocol. Um, how do we go and build these technologies to work better for us over longer periods of time. I can tell you by being involved in the dot-com movement and also before that and before that and before that in the internet structures, um, we, the equivalent of us, gathered to try to solve some of these problems and we came up with the best answers that we could at the technologies of the time. The things that we have that they didn't have is encryption, we've got um, hashing, uh, we've got broad adoption of uh, I, uh, IP protocols, how do we go and leverage those new technologies to build better technologies than what we had before? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yvonne, I want to pass it to you for that question as well. Just how has it been working in this decentralized web? You know, I typically call this the crypto space um, in terms of trying to bring in that diversity. Oh. Yeah, I mean, you know, as, as Brewster is mentioning, I, I think we're seeing a lot of um, interesting um, uses of like decentralized technologies in contexts, you know, like Ukraine and Russia now. Um, you know, for instance, um, people using Tor network to, to reach blocked news sites to, sur to circumvent like surveillance and censorship. Um, you know, there's also interesting work being done with like peer to peer um, communication tools. Um, tools like, like Mepeo, which um, Digital Democracy developed that with um, indigenous communities in the Amazon to uh, for, for open source um, mapping uh, via like a peer-to-peer -peer network. So there's a lot of interesting um, uh, examples of, I think, decentralized tech being used. Um, I, I, I'm not so much seeing that much in terms of um, uh, Preservation. So my, our, our, at Witness, we're really focused. We're our focus is on uh, video, and my background is as an audio visual archivist. Um, and I currently am not really aware of many projects, um, you know, community-based projects, um, smaller scale projects that are doing preservation using decentralized web tools. The projects that I know of, you know, that uh, that are around now are like you know the Internet Archive or projects like Starling Lab that are sort of larger scale organizations with. Um, more um, resources. Um, I think there's still a lot of um, questions, um, uh, learning and, uh, and development to be done um, before, um, you know, I think smaller, uh, smaller scale organizations um, might be able to participate in preservation um, on, the, on, on the decentralized web. You know, I think some of the questions, you know, include like, I think security, uh, Brewster mentioned is a big one. Um, I think we need to have a better understanding of the security risks of putting things on the decentralized web. You know, for instance, like the immutability um, that is sort of touted as a feature, uh, I think um, is, is not necessarily always what um, is, is, is needed in, in, in for certain, uh, in certain sort of threat models. Um, uh, I think there's questions about um, like the economic model. So like so how much will it cost uh, you know, a small organization, a community-based organization to keep their stuff stored um, on the decentralized web. Are those costs going to be predictable over time? 
Um, I think there's, you know, just uh, questions about like migration, like a lot of collections, um, you know, aren't online, and and how do you how do you how do you get them onto the decentralized web? Um, but I think there is a, a a role for these larger institutions like Internet Archive who are doing these sort of pilot projects now that um, that we could learn from and, and and grow from there. Yeah, so let's dig into some of the issues, some of the ones that Yvonne mentioned, but the first one I want to start out with is curation. Um, so maybe Kelsey, you can take this one. Um, because I'm, if you're preserving a bunch of environmental data, and environmental data that you know is factual over some of the stuff that's just on the wider web, let's say, how how do we figure out how to get regular internet users to that specific site, and then sort of filter through, you know, filter through all the data, right, to get to what they need and, and what they want to learn. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And, and I want to make sure that when we show up in these spaces, especially these spaces, like this is the Filecoin space, the Filecoin Foundation space today. This is a decentralized web panel. I want to make sure that when we have these conversations, we're not just going to assume that it is a good tool or the right tool for all things, or maybe for any things, right? I, I want us to be questioning, actually, like uh, Yvonne and I spoke on the, on the phone or you know, Zoom or whatever, a month ago. Um, <laughs> and one of the things that I really appreciated that she said is she was like, look, don't tell me about you know, any of these technologies that I can't hand to people on the ground. Um, if it's not going to make their lives better, I don't want them using it. Um, and I think that we're kind of in that space right now where, where there is this big concern about um, you know, the, the internet's a huge place. And finding things, finding the right thing that you're actually looking for is quite hard. And an overload of information, you know, that's like a classic technique for hiding information. Um, so, so I think that's a really good question. Um, there's a couple of different angles to look at this from. We've been presented with the issue before of trying to figure out, um, in a particular instance, there was a chemical, um, there was a chemical tank that caught on fire actually here in Texas. Um, and during the course of that, one of the air monitoring pieces was taken offline. And so the Sierra Club actually came and approached us and said, hey, it might be really important to save this data in case, you know, the folks handling these air monitors, like based on that activity, we don't know if that's totally a trustworthy entity at this point. So can you make sure this gets saved? And we came and looked at this and said, well, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like the, there's a, it's a small team, and, and we were like, I don't know what the right thing is to save. Like, we're not necessarily the experts on what's going to be necessary down the line in case people, you know, get really sick and need to be able to sue or to prove something. Um, and so that's one of those really hard questions, is you need subject matter experts if you're trying to decide which data to save in a certain way. Um, another way of answering that question is to instead say, um, let's assume that we have some amount of data that we consider to have passed some like bar of criticality, right? Um, now maybe the prioritization question is how at risk is it and from what? Um, and uh, I have a paper actually that I worked on with some folks at the Earth Science Information Partners called Risk Assessment for Scientific Data, which might be like a good start to just kind of, you know, put stuff on a matrix of how likely is this and how like political endangerment, uh, floods, tsunamis, like uh, all this different stuff, that might be a really helpful way to begin to do that assessment and say, okay, well, this, this is going to be you know, what we say first because we're most worried about it. And you don't even just want to say, let's now put this on the decentralized web and assume it's safe forever. Instead, you want to say, hey, what's Web 2 good at? And what's Web 3 good at? And if this is a really critical piece of data, what are the overlaps that we can create between these two technologies such that it's safe from both of those things? Because you might have an issue, for example, in the Web3 technology where a lot of this stuff is new. If it stops working, you know, that's a different kind of risk. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, of course. That's the parallels for what you're describing in our community is is similar. And you're, we haven't written a white paper on it. You're definitely thinking about it in an advanced way. but. You know, I think initially in our space, there was a lot of excitement of just, let's put the stuff online. Let's get it online. Isn't that exciting? Great, it's there. And this curatorial layer is coming later, right? And I would say when I talk to our partners, one of the core questions they're focused on is how do I get my stuff used, right? How do I make it so that people can curate their own collections? How can I increase the discoverability and impact 
of our, of our materials. So when we think about the possibilities, that's one of the areas that, that pops up a lot. And the other is sort of what <laughs> maximum storage really can, the possibilities for that, right? So we've begun to explore with a set of partners, um, to how do we take advantage of the fact that there's seven times as many libraries in the US as there are McDonald's? Right? How do we take advantage of the place-based value that these institutions bring to the country? And can we take advantage of that sort of foot traffic and experience? And what does a digital library in place look like? And can we do things like individual archiving and lean into sort of reimagining what archiving really looks like? And then also layer in that, that use layer. Yeah, no, I, love, I would love to see that happen. I'm a big supporter of libraries over here. I um, feel like they're you know, undervalued in the US. Um, and, and yeah, so, so piggybacking off that, um, you know, there are some, all of this technology is, is actually really tough to use. You know, I, I assume that most people here are sort of crypto native um, or have used, you know, MetaMask, yeah, Bitcoin, yada, 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 all these different um, crypto protocols. But it is a struggle. So even if you sort of know how to move through that process, a lot of people don't. Um, and I'll just, again, I'll give one example. So I, I did this this poetry project recently where it also had an NFT that I was just airdropping to folks. And I brought over five of my friends and said, I want you to, to test this, right? And taking them through the process of like setting up a MetaMask, adding the Matic network. And if you don't know what some of this means, this is the point, right? It's just all very challenging. Um, and then to get them to get them the actual NFT, you know, these are some of my good friends, and they were like, is this a scam? Are you trying to steal my money? Mm. And I'm like, of course not. Um, but this is the problem, is like a lot of this stuff is just, for the everyday user, it's just too tough right now. And so um, these two have made wonderful points there. Um, Brewster, I want to throw it to you, because you had mentioned um, policy and flexibility. And I feel like those are almost oxymorons, to be fair. <laughs> Um, and so I want you to maybe talk about the issues that you're seeing around uh, policy, regulation, legislation with this kind of decentralized web architecture and technology. I think content moderation is going to be one of our big challenges uh, out there. And we would like to get uh, us thinking about what do we do in that space. And not all content moderation, I would suggest, is bad to do. Um, in the, uh, universal access and privacy are a bit of the sort of flip parts of the same coin. So how do we go and build systems uh, that, that work um, better there? And how do we engage a lot of people in this process? So uh, to sort of try to answer the how do you go and scale, right, from, uh, from the small group that Edgy started as, but is now a network of massive numbers. Um, the Internet Archive has 900 library and museum partners that are archiving the web sort of for their own. Um, and they basically use the Internet Archive as a platform to go and uh, build this, and it all goes into the Wayback Machine, and then people can go and pull at, at it for different purposes. And we're trying to figure out how much commercial use should we allow to people data strafing the Internet Archive? Like, you know, you can take this sort of your classic, let's, let's just look for email addresses, right? It's okay, that would be bad. Um, but there's other more scammy things you can imagine um, that you could go and build profiles uh, of people out of. And it's a little bit of how much do you trust the world with the data? Um, and how, you know, if you're in the Ukraine right now, the answer would probably be not very much. Um, and, but what we've had in the United States for the last quite a while is quite a bit. And how do we go and build systems that have a continuity um, across that where people are feeling that's not necessarily the most um, uh, taken care of by the tech community um, and basically understand and build systems that work for them as well. Um, we've taken a relatively centralized structure for access uh, restrictions and uh, we call them policy because it's not just things that are illegal, it's things that just shouldn't be available, or there's privacy, trademark, other types of, of, uh, uh, of issues. But if there's something that I, I would love to have conversations about, either this, this weekend, uh, this week, or, or other times, is some of the content moderation issues that we're going to run into really quickly. Because if you take um, Bit, uh, BitTorrent as sort of one of the first, the you know, real decentralized 
structures. And we built um, dweb.archive.org, you know, somewhat on Filecoin, somewhat on, on dweb, somewhat on, on these uh, on, on, on BitTorrent type structures to go and make it so it's easy to use, right? So it's you, you just use dweb.archive.org, and presto, you're using the decentralized web. Cool. But um, but you think about what happened to BitTorrent. They got kind of pushed into a corner of just doing, you know, movies for free, right? Um, but it's so much better technology than that. I think it's kind of what's going on with, uh, with Bitcoin and some of the, it's, it's being pushed out of, it could be the alley pay of America. Um, but it's not, why not, right? And uh, so we've got some policy issues, governance problems, um, but uh, we have some uh, uh, ways to go such as being pushed into just doing crappy things. Some of the first uses of some of these decentralized storage structures are going to be going and holding and storing things that are pushed off of other environments. So we're going to run into this soon. Um, so let's get ahead of it. Let's show that we're talking about it. Um, let's see if we can come up with some solutions um, and uh, try to get some of the policy aspects going forward sooner rather than later. Yeah, for sure. Um, Yvonne, I wanted to pass it to you to talk a little bit more about some, maybe some challenges. Um, but in terms of correcting the records, so we talk about blockchain being permanent and immutable. And I guess one of the things that I worry about in, in, in that conversation is that the bureaucracy to then change that piece of content or whatever you have done, the hurdle is just so high to do that, right? So, you know, while there could be like a list of the corrections, so say you write a news article, needs a correction, right now that's easy, right? Correction at the bottom, you change the story. But if this is all on an immutable blockchain, you know, does that become a lot harder to, to change? Um, and how do then people, this is the same, curation problem, how do people find that correction if it's on a different place on the blockchain? So I don't know, Yvonne, uh, if, if you want to sort of take that question, because maybe some of the work that you've been seeing in the video space, in the video archiving space is like that, where someone might say a stat, and then actually that stat is wrong, and they, you know, you need to go back and correct it, or something of that nature. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly uh, certainly a challenge. I mean, just to go back to your first point about this high uh, bar to entry, um, you know, I definitely agree that there is this sort of uh, high barrier for, you know, ordinary people, communities to sort of get into this D web space. Like, as you mentioned, in terms of just like literacy and understanding of what, you know, what crypto, what all of these things are, but also when we're talking about things like decentralized storage, there's like high cost of entry, you know, for heart, like to, to be anything other than a consumer or a user of the technology, as opposed to somebody who is part of creating it, there is, a, a, I think, a huge um, barrier in terms of cost and hardware and all of those things. Um, I think, you know, another barrier is also just the concern about like risks. Um, you know, this relates to the policy discussion we were just having. Um, uh, you know, like when 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 we're working within like cent centralized structures, like with with big tech companies or with state, uh, you know, governments and state apparatuses, um, they do provide some degree of protection in some cases. Like there's regulations, there's legal protections, and, you know, legal liability and insurance when you when you operate within like, these sort of centralized place state structures. And then, so what does that mean when you when you don't have those kind of protections anymore? Um, you know, I think there's also questions around. Um, you know, this, there's some, uh, uh, you know, some argument that there's like the, there's there is value to certain types of you know centralization, uh, as Brewster was saying. So, um, you know, when when things are completely decentralized, how does uh, I mean, what is the potential for that to sort of undermine, you know, traditional um, accountability um, structures or rule of law? Like, so example I'm thinking of is like you know people talking about how crypto might be used. Um, you know, for Russia to undermine economic sanctions that are being imposed by states. Um, or just, you know, recently the example of um, uh, Russia developing its own um, uh, TLS certificates to certify Russian websites, you know, that's like, you know, independent of, you know, the international, you know, certification um, bodies. Um, so yes, I think, you know, I think there are a lot of, um, 
questions and challenges like the immutability one you just um, mentioned. And I think these are all the things that, you know, we need to um, address and, 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 and include um, people in the process. Again, as I was saying, not just as users and consumers of the technology, um, although that's okay if that's what people want to be. And, and I think in many cases, like people just, they don't really care that much about the underlying, you know, technological architecture. They just want um, the, a tool that helps them do what they were intending to do. And, you know, I appreciate Kelsey bringing up the conversation we had previously about, you know, um, like, you know, people people uh, want something that, that, that works and, um, you know, I think maybe, um, you know, approach is to sort of make sure we bake into all of those considerations into the tools that we create and then people, the users don't really have to like worry about it, like they just need to use the tools and they have, you know, these kind of considerations and security concerns kind of um, incorporated into the into the design. Yeah, um, Kelsey, did you want to piggyback off that? Yeah, I did. I know my introduction was a long one, but I'm at edgy and also at Starling Lab in the middle of a civic science fellowship. So I find myself in this bridge role fairly often. Um, you know, edgy works on this environmental data justice concept, but not typically from a decentralized web perspective. And then Starling Lab is in this space of being, um, looking at Web3 technologies, but in as neutral as possible of a way. And what Starling does that I think is really, really cool is they go out and they find cohorts of people who can try stuff that have real needs. Right now, right now the main focus is journalists, um, but because I'm here and because my civic science fellowship is about environmental justice communities, um, we'll also be asking the question of how Web3 technologies can or cannot enable environmental justice communities. Um, and we're not going in assuming that yes, this is gonna work. Um, we're going in with hopes that we might be able to be useful here. But what Starling Lab does that's really cool is meets with the people and says, why'd you show up and raise your hand to be in this cohort? What did you, what did you come here hoping for? And then goes back and has a very small engineering team that's doing non-scalable prototypes of just stitching, duct taping, gluing things together on the back end to make it work like we hope it someday might um, for the people who are actually trying to use this stuff in the field. And we're seeing you know, journalists in different types of critical situations on the ground using these prototype tools. And obviously it's frustrating to some large extent, but they're able to come back and have these meetings with us and say, look, it's only gonna work if, um, but this part was really cool and I wasn't able to do that before. Um, and, and so that's been a really interesting approach and we're looking to, we're hoping to do the same thing with environmental justice communities and go out and say, um, like, look, we're happy to onboard you as much as you like. Um, and, and right now what I'm working on is the archive accelerator, which the concept is basically that a cohort's gonna come in um, and in the space of approximately a weekend, what I'd like them to do, and these, are, these should be non-technologists, I, I would like that these stakeholder groups would come in and basically you know, develop an assessment framework for thinking about both Web 2 and Web 3 technologies, um, spend some time trying different, I think of them as pathways or flows, like from having the data here to having it you know, wherever you're trying to have it in the decentralized web space. Um, do some assessment on that and walk out on the last day having thought about you know, who within my org would I need to pitch uh, what are the things that we know and don't know about the costs and the future stability of this thing? Um, so there's this, this ton of translation work that has to happen, but it's not impossible to do even while the technology is pretty early. And in fact, it's critical that we do this translation work early because we need to be able to get the voices from people who are not typically the technologists um, and, and have them hear you know, problems that might not be encountered by the people who are normally at the table. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to kind of change the subject just a little bit. Uh, one thing I think about a lot, and it's because, again, I've been in crypto a long time, very meme heavy, very like ephemeral nature of communication in the crypto space. So um, maybe Brewster, I'll let you take this one first, but like, is there content that we don't care to save for eternity? So like one example might be every episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians or something like that. You know, is there, uh, how do we, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. I knew somebody. I, somebody will tell me that keeping up with the Kardashians um, should be saved for all time. But I guess, how do you think about what is kept and what is not? 
One of the real challenges of our, of our whole world, right? The, you know, what John was talking about, the existing system is, in general, libraries and archives exist to collect things after people die. Um, so it, there's, there, it was used for something, and then it's dumped on the archives uh, after the fact. And I can tell you, we're getting a lot of, oh, oh let me tell you about Dr. Toy, uh, who, who died, he, he collected toy manuals and toy uh, catalogs for uh, decades. We're getting his physical collection, completely cool. Okay, all right, reel it back in, Brewster. Um, uh, the, uh, but at this point with digital, you have to go and collect it preemptively. It doesn't exist long enough if you don't. Um, like, think of the other drafts of, the, uh, of that great American novel that Kelsey's writing um, that she just overstomped uh, on her Google Drive, right? And it's da 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 um, If you don't get it now, it's, it's gone. And that's a real challenge for trying to figure out how do you make it things not last? Or how do you do the curation? Do you do the curation before or after? And if you do it after, what do you do about the stuff you shouldn't have collected? And archives aren't very good at deleting things. Um, and so how do you go and have things that are kind of marginal? Uh, either because you shouldn't have them, or there's, or there's this concept called the Giftschrankt. Giftschrankt, I'm, I'm mangling the German. It's, um, it's a poison cabinet. Every archive has one. Um, and it's the things that you don't talk about. It's the secret archives of the Vatican, right? It's the stuff that sort of, um, and you, some of that stuff you really should have because it's really necessary to have, but you'd want to limit the use of it. Some of it is like, eh. Um, so how do you go and, and do curation in this digital space um, when you, the time axis has changed so much? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, one thing I am worried about is we may not be able to get access to these materials. If, if the app world wins, then we're sunk, right? We, uh, the Internet Archive really works quite well because we're built on top of an open system, which is the World Wide Web. We can go and crawl things. We're getting blocked by things like paywalls, which is getting to be a problem, and then there's licensing problems and lawsuits. Um, awesome. Great ways to go and, and, um, and basically burn libraries. Um, but imagine app world where you really can't actually get at the stuff at all. Um, from a third party, all right? Going and trying to get in, they don't have APIs. They're really designed around that one uh, application framework. So to the extent that Web3 is really going towards app world, I'm really quite worried. The decentralized web, we were trying to make it still an interlocked, interlinking, interoperable environment. Um, and I'm not sure which way this whole thing is going. You know, there are these words that are not quite defined yet. Um, but we've got some, uh, some challenges ahead of us. Let's make it safe to, to still live in an inter interlocked, interconnected, um, interoperable world um, so that, you know, companies don't feel like they have to be completely uh, uh, beside that to be able to uh, make their businesses work. That some of it's just money, but a lot of it's control. Um, how do we go and, and make that still work so we can have other organizations like libraries, archives, and, and, and others build on top of this ecosystem? Um, well, we'll see how it all plays out, but actually you guys get to be a lot of the game masters. Right? You guys get to go and try to figure out how this game is going to be played. It's early enough that a lot of, even the words aren't even defined yet, much as well as the protocols and how they're going to be used. So let's do a good job of it. Let's get together, have these conversations. Glad you guys are here. This is Decentralized Web Summit this summer. Please come. Um, and, but there's, there's gatherings to try to build a, a web that works better for more people. Um, and that, I hope, is, is, is our challenge, which wasn't quite your question. It's um, right. but uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's all right. Uh, John, I wanted you to add on to that, if, if you could. Yeah. yeah, totally. I mean, I, I think this sort of the historical approach and giving ourselves that arc is so powerful and important. I think one of the lessons I have right from back in the day is this, this notion of, hey, I'm from the Internet. I'm here to help, right, and walking into a, you know, a community or a project and saying, it, that's not going to fly, and it's not going to fly just because we decided that's not going to fly. That's just not going to fly with the communities that we're trying to work with, right? They don't want to hear that. And so the bridging function that you identified, Kelsey, I feel like is so essential in defining what that means and what that really looks like. What does power distribution look like? What do, how do you center marginalized conversations and people in a decentralized environment? And, I, and feed that back up to the developers. It doesn't work totally. if you don't go both ways. Yeah, yeah. totally. 
Okay, yeah. Uh, and just like to wrap this up, because uh, I think we're out of time. Um, yeah, I think it's not our job to curate what we save, right? Because some of the things that I do not think imp are important are important, right? C keeping up with the Kardashians could be important and it could speak to the time that we were in our lives, right? That reality TV was such a big deal. Um, and so one of the examples that I'll just leave y'all with, you guys should visit milliondollarhomepage.com. It is just, some of you will know this, but um, this kid who's like, if I can get a dollar per pixel, and then people started sending him money and advertising on that space. And when you look at it, it is, it's just amazing what the internet used to be like. Uh, and I can't remember exactly when he started that, but it's worth going and looking at those advertisements. And I think stuff like that, at the time, we wouldn't have thought, oh, we should save those. But now that it is still there, I do think it is, um, it's a way to sort of look at the history and look at what the internet and that uh, time period used to be like. So I say, save it all. <laughs> but yeah, that's all for our panel. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you to the panelists.